We are live. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming along. Um, we have Sam Shimon today. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. We are the disciples of Yahweh. This is Truth Seeker. Oh, let me show. I want to see. I want you all to see Sam making. Uh, yeah, showing off. Don't have. <laughs> biceps. Yeah, get those on there. All right. <laughs> this is muscular apologetics, friends. Uh, I wish I did. I'm all. <laughs> all right and my my other half is jody bishop tell us what's going on jody well we we are going to discuss we discussed the trinity from a oneness perspective we had a, a oneness friend on and who sam thoroughly defeated and then we also had an arian uh, that, uh, you know, they believe in, you know, Jesus is a lower creation or was created, and he's just a God or just a man. So mm -hmm. we got that uh, defeated. We defeated that. Which, which one of them was Arian? I, uh, was it or, Tracer or the other gentleman? John or John. Okay, so he was the Arian. I couldn't tell. I really couldn't tell the difference between their views because they're basically saying the same thing. But Okay, may, maybe it is. Maybe he don't describe himself, and if John's listening and I'm, and correct, please correct me. But, you know, he done a very excellent job on this. So I think an underserved part of the Trinity that a lot of theologians, a lot of ministers do not focus on is the Holy Spirit. So we're going to be discussing is the Holy Spirit more than just an active force? Mm -hmm. So um, let me enter and introduce you, Brother Sam Shimon. Yes, yeah, sounds like baboon. Shamoon, baboon. Shamoon, shamoon. <laughs> la, 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 la. What's happening? It's good to be here to serve you guys again. And I do ask the Son of God, the Father's beloved, <clears throat> the eternal companion of the Spirit, to bless your ministries, help you to prosper for his glory, bless your families, your loved ones, and preserve you in holiness. And I pray that for myself, that the Lord Jesus will enable me to be a doer of his word, truly love the Lord, not be lip service, and that the Lord will complete the work he's begun in us. And may the Lord Jesus take over the session, our lives, our ministries, the lives of our loved ones, my case, my daughters. And by the Spirit, enable us to exegete scriptures correctly and refute heresy so we can take every Jehovah Witness captive for the glory of the true Jesus and the power of his true spirit in Jesus' name. So it's good to be with you guys again, to serve you for the sake of the Lord. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you. And... Uh... Right. And uh, don't forget, I didn't mention it, but don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Disciples of YHWH in Christ. And also pray for us and, you know, share the video, share it to non-Trinitarians, your Jehovah Witness friends, share it amongst friends, and then you will grow deeper in the knowledge of the scriptures. Also, please hit the like button uh, so we can get this video out there and get more people <clears throat> in here watching. So, uh, Brother Sam, I was thinking about this when we we're mm -hmm. going to talk about the Holy Spirit, and it seems to me that the denial of the Holy Spirit uh, comes in three in three possible ways. One, they'll deny the, the deity of, of the Spirit. Two, they'll deny the personhood of the Spirit. And three, they'll deny the distinction of the Spirit. We have various... Um, heretical organizations that, that take any or all of these positions. And of course, we have the Muslims who are just confused, I think. So I think we can answer all of those today, or at least begin to. Uh, tell me what you think of that. Yeah, well, remember, the Jehovah's Witnesses are those who deny the personhood of the Holy Spirit. They believe the Holy Spirit is God's active force. It's the force that he uses to influence <clears throat> people on earth. So he sends the spirit as this force, you know, like uh, Star Wars theology, <laughs> force be right. with you, right? Yeah. Luke, danger, the force. So this force is God's influence, his energy, so to speak, that yeah. he uses to influence his creatures to guide them, but he's not a person. So that's what they believe. That's why I guess it's... Uh, titled Joe's Witnesses, right? The Holy Spirit is the, oh no, I thought, I thought the title yeah. had some Joe's Witnesses. See, Jody, you got me confused. Uh, anyway. Jody, we can't see you if you're not talking. The, the video oh, doesn't switch. Right. Uh, it, it's in this book. It says, uh, this is a Jehovah Witness publication. And it says, what does the Bible really teach book? And That's it calls, uh, just reading from their book, it says, let's see, uh, God's, uh, 
Let's see. Yeah. At the moment when God's spirit or active force was poured out upon that day, Jesus became the Messiah or Christ, the one appointed by the lead, leader and king. So they say Jesus or the Holy Spirit is God's active force. Okay, Jody, you had your fingers over the book. Can you hold it up again without and, and from the okay. sides and then say something? All right. Okay, there's the book. All right, there. And it, as usual, it has no author. The, the Jehovah's Witness publications or Watchtower societies never give you an author's name, so you can never check out the person's credentials and find out where they went to school and if they really know Greek and Hebrew or if they know anything from anything. Yeah. And we have no idea who wrote it. Yeah, Typical. now... I thought this was originally titled <clears throat> Responding to Joe's Witnesses. I guess probably you changed the title because I remember seeing it. Maybe I was. Well, I, that's... I thought that the session had JWs in the title, but I guess I probably must saw that, but that's okay. It's, it's... Actually, actually, you're correct that we're like trying that. to. Uh, you I know, like Jody, changing stuff on me last, but it doesn't matter. We can. Right. So uh, actually, you're I right. Assumed this was about Joe's Witnesses. Do you want me to now focus on them or I would the, rather I would rather you focus on the Jehovah Witnesses. Yeah, because I can do all three, Lord willing. But if you want me to focus primarily in the JW view, I can do that and then we can look at the other two views. So <clears throat> that's why I had told Scott to bring up the JW translation or the website with their translation. So let's get the Joe's Witnesses out of the way. They do believe the spirit is eternal because he's not created, but he's not a heat. And this is something I want to teach Christians about the way the Bible is written. Sometimes you will have personal beings <clears throat> described with <clears throat> pronouns that are neuter, meaning they're neither male nor female. And then depending on which language you're looking at, because the Old Testament is written primarily in Hebrew, parts of it in Aramaic, and the New Testament is written in Greek. Depending on the language, certain nouns will either be masculine or feminine or neuter in gender. Now, neuter only works for Greek. From my recollection, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic don't have a neuter when using nouns for objects. They're either masculine or feminine. Greek has a neuter. Why? why, why Actually, should... Sam, yes. uh, Hebrew has a common. It, the, other, the other gender... In, in Hebrew is common, male, uh, female, common. Okay, gender. common, yeah. So we wouldn't basically say neuter, though, but it's common. All right. Right. We wouldn't say neuter. That's correct. Yeah. But the Greek does have a neuter. It's neither male nor female. Now, people may be wondering why am I saying this. I'm Hopefully, I'm not saying it to impress you. I pray we make Jesus happy and not impress one another. It's because mm -hmm. in Hebrew, the word for spirit, roach, is a feminine noun. So if I base the gender off a noun, the Holy Spirit is female. But then in Greek, the word for spirit, pneuma or pneuma, is neuter. It's it. It's neither male nor female. This is why you need to be careful. As serious students in the Bible, don't make too much out of the gender or lack thereof of the nouns. Because in Hebrew, because someone tried to do that in my comment section. Someone said to me, see, the Holy Spirit rock, feminine, that's female. And I'm going to say, oh, but in Greek, it's pneuma, it's, it's neuter, neither he nor she. So there's gender confusion. That's not how we demonstrate the personhood of the Holy Spirit. We don't demonstrate his personhood so much because of the gender of the noun or the gender of the pronouns. Because in the Greek New Testament, neuter, neuter pronouns are used of the father and the son. What is a neuter? Neuter means neither male nor female. It, that, which. In the Greek New Testament, you will find the authors describing God the Father as a what, not as a who, and Jesus as a what, or as a that, that which. But that doesn't mean the Father is not a person or the Son is not a person. That's nonsense. We know they're persons, but they are unlike human persons. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Where do we find in the New Testament where God the Father is described with neuter pronouns? He's described as a what? John 4, 20 to 22, specifically verse 22. And then I'm going to show you the same thing with Jesus. So that's not how you serious Bible students prove the personhood of an object or a subject. That's not how you do it. So I'm going to show you how we do it. Because there's another element 
a literary feature that the biblical writers use called personification. So we're going to get this out of the way. And then I'm going to show you how from the Jehovah's Witness Bible, you show the spirit is a person. And then we'll show that he's not the father, not the son, and that he is truly deity. In John 4, 20 to 22, what does it say about God the Father? All right, John 4, verse 20. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Notice what he didn't say. You worship who we don't know or what? what? Oh, wait, so the Father's a what? You worship what you what you do not know. But he's talking about the Father. We worship what we know instead of saying who. But that doesn't mean the Father is not a person. That would be nonsense, wouldn't it? Yes. Absolutely. Now let's see where the neuter pronoun is used of Jesus. In the first epistle of John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Verses 1 to 3. That which we have, uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. He doesn't say, Scott. He mm -hmm. who was from the beginning. It that says which that was which. From the beginning. And that's not about Jesus. How do we know it's about Jesus? Because we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it. And testify to it and pro proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Well, Jesus is the word of life. He is life and he is eternal life. The word of life, the revelation of life. And he's life because what did our Lord say in John eleven twenty five? 25? I am the resurrection and the life. What did our Lord say in John 14, verse 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what does John 1 say about the, Jesus? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh. So here our Lord is described as a that and a which and an it, but who would deny that he's a person? No one's going to deny that. So that's not how you establish personhood or lack thereof. Neuter pronouns or nouns doesn't mean that the subject is not a person. That's not how biblical languages work. So do not fall for that. If a Joe witness tries to tell you, well, look, it's a new and so what? It's neuter. Or look, it's feminine. Irrelevant because just it so happens that part and parcel of the languages is that nouns and pronouns may have gender or like you said a common Meaning that it refers to all genders or a neuter genderless But it doesn't mean the subject is not personal. So that's the first point I want to get out of the way as Holy Spirit grants us clarity of thought speak uh, clearly for the glory of Christ the second the second <clears throat> mistake many people tend to fall into the Bible writers will often personify characteristics. They will take inanimate objects, objects that are not conscious or personal, and personify them, describe them as persons. You find this quite often in what's known as wisdom literature. You find that in Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. I mention that because in Proverbs chapter 8, you have wisdom described as a woman, a female. If you go to Proverbs chapter 8, Brother, if you look at the first three verses, who is speaking and what's the gender of the speaker? <clears throat> does not wisdom call, does not under understanding raise her voice? <clears throat> her voice? Yes, hers. Okay, keep going. On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. You can stop there. Here, wisdom and understanding are personified as a woman that cries. No, she, her. Now, this is talking about God's attribute. This passage is often used by Joe's witnesses to say, this is Jesus speaking. We can, we'll get to that in maybe a future session. But what's the point? Why is wisdom speaking as a woman? He, she, her voice, she says, she cries out. Because it so happens that the word wisdom in Hebrew is chokmah. Or some will say chokmah. Chokmah in Hebrew is a feminine noun. Feminine noun. Now, the Greek word for wisdom is also a feminine noun. It's Sophia. Sophia. Since the nouns for the word wisdom are feminine, when you want to take wisdom, which is an attribute, not a person, and speak of it as a person, 
then you're going to describe with them as a female so it can correspond with the gender of the noun. So if the noun is feminine, you're not going to speak of wisdom as a him, but as a she and a her. But that's not because she's a woman. This is personification. So be careful of reading a passage where wisdom, like in Proverbs 8, is being addressed as if wisdom is a person that's a woman. Well, here wisdom is God's attribute. And God's attributes are not conscious persons. They're characteristics that are part of his essence, right? But why is wisdom being described as a woman? Because the words for wisdom are feminine. So if you're going to try to personify wisdom, you're going to agree with the gender of the noun. So if it's female, you're not going to describe it as a male. If it's male, you're not going to describe it as a female. So I just want to be clear. So these are not the ways you go about establishing personhood because you have characteristics that are personified, but they're not persons. Now, I mentioned that because that's how the Jehovah's Witnesses try to get around the fact the Holy Spirit speaks. They go, that's personification. When the Holy Spirit speaks, that's because the Holy Spirit is being personified. Well, there's a major problem with it. There are two major problems with it. Number one, the Holy Spirit is described as speaking in books that are not wisdom literature and do not necessarily use personification. Now, don't get me wrong. Even in biography and history, you can have a speaker personifying something in his speech. But for the most part, the evidence has to be clear that's what's taking place. Because the Holy Spirit is described in a person in historical narratives. And the second line of evidence that supports the Holy Spirit is not being personified, but he's a person, is that he exhibits personal characteristics alongside of other persons. He's doing things with other persons, showing like them, he is a person, but a different kind of person. So now I hope I didn't confuse anyone. Let me now give you examples from the Jehovah's Witness Bible where you can show passages where clearly it's not personification. The Holy Spirit speaks and acts because he's truly a person. Because the context shows it can't be otherwise. Go to John 15, 26 to 27. I hope I wasn't confusing as I try to elaborate. John 15, 26 in the Watchtower uh, translation. When the Helper comes that I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, which comes from the Father, that one will bear witness about me. And you, in turn, are to bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. See, this can't be personification because you have two groups bearing witness of Jesus. Notice the context. The disciples will bear witness of Jesus from the beginning alongside the Holy Spirit. So this can't be personification any more than the apostles are personifications. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness with other persons. Now, the only difference is the disciples are human persons, whereas the Holy Spirit is a divine person. What do I mean? When I use the term person, there are different sorts of persons. You have human persons, you have angelic persons, and you have divine persons, right? <clears throat> By person, when I, when I refer to the Spirit as a person, I do not mean... The spirit is a human person in that he has a physical mortal body bound to time, space, and place, and he's temporal and finite. That's not how we're defining the term. <clears throat> By person, we simply mean the spirit is conscious, has cogni uh, cognition, he has awareness, he's aware that he exists, he's aware that others exist, he has emotions. They're similar to ours, but different, obviously, because God loves, we love, but God loves on a whole higher and different way. He has a volition, he has a will, desires. So he's a person in that sense. But because he's a divine person, he doesn't have a corporeal, material body. He's not bound to time, space, or place. So he's a divine person. Human persons have physical bodies. They're bound to time, space, and place. A angels are also persons in that sense, being that they're conscious. They have desires. They have volition. They can speak and be spoken to. They're, they're aware. And because they're part of creation, I know a lot of Christians don't, don't reflect on this. Anything that's part of creation, creation is bound to time, space, and place. So that angels are spirits, but not spirits in the same way that God is spirit. God is spirit in the sense of that he's immaterial, incorporeal, spaceless, timeless, but he can still enter creation and manifest his presence visibly in bodily shape, a la the incarnation where Jesus actually becomes truly human. 
Angels, because they're also part of creation, they're spirits. In their spirits, they have a shape and a body of some kind. They, they, can, act, they can actually change, but they're still bound to time, space, and place. But because they're more powerful creatures than, ours, than us, they have abilities we don't have. They can go from one place to another in a nanosecond, but they can't be present everywhere because they're creatures. This is biblical theology, guys. I'm giving you basic biblical theology so you know the difference between an angelic person, a human person, and a divine person. But how does this passage refute the Jehovah's Witnesses? It's a narrative in which Jesus says persons, i.e. the apostles, will be carrying out a personal function along with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and the apostles will all testify. Well, which Jehovah's Witnesses will deny that the apostles are persons, which is why they can testify? Nobody. So then how are you going to deny the Holy Spirit is a person as well? Because he's doing the same thing that other persons do. So it's not personification. That's just one example. Let's go now to John 16, 12 to 13. In the John, New World Translation? Yes. Well, let's, for this, we'll just stay with the New World Translation. All right. What was the verse number again, please? John 16, 12 to 13. Okay, 12. Got it. I still have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them now. However, when that one comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but what he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things to come. Okay, I'm a little confused, Scott. How can an impersonal force hear anything and then teach what he hears from another? And those sound like human qualities to me. Humans okay. teach, or persons, uh, yes. beings with personhood, individuals with personhood, hear and speak. Yeah, because it makes no sense to say that the paraclete, the spirit of truth, right, will not speak of his own initiative. What initiative does he have? He's not a person, according to Je Jehovah's Witnesses. And he'll only speak what he hears. Hear from what? He's not a conscious person, according to Jehovah's Witnesses. So this passage also refutes the lie that he's not a person because he does not speak on his own initiative, meaning he has a volition, but he subjects his volition to the volition of another. That's a person. And he only speaks what he hears. So not only does he speak, he hears. So he hears from someone and he teaches others. Clearly, he's a person. In fact, when it says he will not speak on his own initiative, that, those words, own initiative, are used by Jesus of himself. He uses those words, own initiative. I believe the Greek is out, out to. Go to John 5, 19. Jesus says something similar about himself. John 5.19. Therefore, in response, Jesus said to them, Most truly, I say to you, the Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative, same but Greek only what words. he sees the Father doing. Wait, you see it? Same Greek words. The Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative. The Spirit will not speak of his own initiative, but he only does what he sees the Father doing. Who denies that Jesus is a person, even before he became flesh? And he's not two persons. He's one divine person who became human. We're not historians. We're not heretics. But the same language uses the Holy Spirit. I will not speak of my own initiative, neither will the Holy Spirit. I only speak what I hear from the Father, like he only speaks what he hears from me and the Father. This is irrefutable. This is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. But it's going to get worse for the Jehovah's Witnesses, our friends. Go to Acts 5, verses 3 to 4. Acts 5, verses 3 to 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan emboldened you to lie to the Holy Spirit and secretly hold back some of the price of the field? As long as it remained with you, did it not remain yours? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you thought up such a deed as this in your heart? You have, not, you have lied not to men, but to God. And I'm, I'm really confused, Scott. It says, Ananias lied to God. Ananias lied to the apostles and lied to the Holy Spirit. Now, I can understand how you can lie to God. He's a person. I can also understand how you lie to apostles. They're persons. But how can you lie to the Holy Spirit when he's not a person? Impossible. Can't lie to a, a non-person. So right. in that same context, there are three groups that are being lied to. God is being lied to. Apostles are being lied to. And the Spirit is being lied to. Since the spirit is being lied to along with two other groups that are persons, how can you say it's personification? 
Doesn't well, I make can't, sense. Right. I can't lie to my rock. I can't lie to my car, but I can lie to the Holy Spirit or I can lie to Scott or you, but I can't lie to a rock. So you have human persons and two divine persons being lied to. God the Father there. That's God the Father. He's a person. Holy Spirit is a person and apostles are human persons. So it's not personification. That's not going to work here. Sorry, Joe's Witnesses. Your own translation, it's not going to work here. But then in the same chapter, read verse 9. Now, Ananias' wife, Sapphira, who also agreed to lie with her husband and got punished accordingly. Acts 5, verse 9. Who did she test or tempt? So Peter said to her, why did you two agree to make a test of the spirit of Jehovah? And by the way, two, two points. The word Jehovah is inserted in the English translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses 237 times. You notice here it says spirit of Jehovah. 237 times the Jehovah's Witnesses inserted the word Jehovah in the translation of the New Testament. And they will also admit to you, there's not a single Greek copy in existence where the New Testament writers, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, use the divine name. The Greek word is not Jehovah, it's Kyrios, Kurios, Lord. But they decided to replace 237 occurrences of the Greek word for Lord, Kurios, Kyrios, with Jehovah. Literally, it says Spirit of the Lord. It doesn't say Spirit of Jehovah, so that's one. Number two, that word, why have you agreed to test the Spirit of Jehovah? That's the same word rendered as tempt. For example, Matthew 4, 1, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the tempter. So Jesus was tempted by the devil. And then in James 1, 13, we are told when you are tempted with evil, you not say God is tempting you because God cannot be tempted with evil. So God cannot be tempted. Same word. Jesus was tempted and the Holy Spirit was tempted. How do you test? How do you tempt a force? Can't do that either. But Sapphira did. So Ananias Sapphira lied to and tempted the Holy Spirit. Like Ananias lied to the apostles and God. So this cannot be personification. Because the context is referring to persons who are performing personal acts or possess personal characteristics. Personification won't work here. And it won't work in Acts 5.32. Acts 5, 32. Watch there. And we are witnesses of these matters, and so is the Holy Spirit, which God has given to those obeying him as ruler. You're again confusing me, Scott. The apostles are persons. We know they can bear witness. But how do they bear witness with the Holy Spirit that God has given those who fear him if the Holy Spirit is not a person? Yeah, not possible. The Holy Spirit has to have personhood especially when he's performing the same personal characteristics that other persons are performing. He, with the apostles, are bearing, bearing witness. So these are passages in the Joseph translation that shuts down the appeal to personification. That explanation will not work. Now let's go to Acts 15, 28. Acts 15, 28. This is, again, their translation. For the Holy Spirit and we ourselves have favored adding no further burden to you except these necessary things. We have favored with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in us have favored, have discerned. This is what's best for you because the word means mm -hmm. to discern. We've discerned and the Holy Spirit has discerned with us. This is what's best for you. How can the Holy Spirit discern anything if he doesn't have a mind and knows what's best and knows that this is better than that? And how can he discern with other persons who have the ability to discern? Doesn't work. Right? I mean, it's right there, their own translation. Uh, are we reading our translation or their translation? This is the uh, this is jw.org. You can see the URL right there. Okay. A couple more witnesses. from Acts, and we'll then segue into the deity of the Holy Spirit from their own Bible as well. But let's go now to Acts 10, 19 to 20. Acts 10, 19 to 20. As Peter was still pondering over the vision, the spirit said, look, three men are asking for you. So get up, go downstairs and go with them, not doubting at all because I have sent them. Okay, so the Holy Spirit speaks and he refers to himself with uh, singular personal pronouns. Go, I have sent them. So was a personification speaking to a person commanding him what to do? 
No, that, no, that doesn't work. Person. Get up, Peter. I'm telling you what to do. Don't hesitate because I brought them to you so you can preach the message of salvation. I sent them. Go. That's not a personification commanding a person. That's a person who believes he is the Lord of the church and Lord of creation because he commands the church what to do and he brings people to salvation. So notice it's a spirit that brings people to salvation and the spirit who sends people to preach the message because he's a sovereign Lord. It's right there. What about Acts 13, verse 2? But we're going to read verses 1 and 4. Acts 13, verse 2, but we're going to read verses 1 and 4 from the New World Translation. Now in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers in the local congregation. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaton, who was educated with Herod, the district ruler, and Saul. Verse 2, as they were ministering to Jehovah and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set aside for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Wait, they the have... Holy Spirit said, set apart for me? Mm -hmm. The work that I, I have called them? Yep. So a personification is talking to a group of persons, commanding them who to send and where to send them. You can go all the way to four. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So these men, sent out by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed away to Cyprus. So the Holy Spirit sent them, commanded them, and ordered them to do the work that the Holy Spirit assigned them to do. Clearly, you can't get around this. There's too much evidence. The Holy Spirit exhibits personal characteristics along with other persons, and it's not personification. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that in historical narrative, you know, history or biographies like the Gospels are biographies on Jesus, that the speakers in the narrative won't use personification. Of course, there are examples they do, because in everyday speech, speech, our language is rich. Sometimes we'll use hyperbole, simile, allegory. That's how language. But in these contexts, it's not personification or hyperbole, because the spirit is exhibiting personal characteristics alongside of other persons that no one will deny are persons. The only difference is that the Holy Spirit is a different kind of person, He's divine. He's not human, nor is he an angelic creature. Now, let's go to Ephesians 4.30. Does the Holy Spirit exhibit emotions? Ephesians 4, verse 30. Uh, Sam, I, meant, I wanted to make a quick comment because you had touched on this before when describing what personhood involves. And it involves having a distinction from other persons and awareness of them and the ability to enter into I, you relationships with them. And we see here in the passages that you were just reading or uh, that you were just uh, discussing that the spirit says, I sent them, I assigned them, I called them. There's a I, you relationship. And that uh, again is a, a demonstrates personhood. Yep, there you go. You All can't right. get around it. And this is their translation. Now, sadly, there are a few places where they mistranslate, but we got their interlinear to correct them, which we'll, right. we'll get to. Uh, I'll show you from their own interlinear, the Greek that they use, where they deliberately left out words or mistranslated because they didn't want the passage to say what it says lest someone discovers the truth of the Holy Spirit. But in Ephesians 4.30, does the Holy Spirit exhibit emotions? Also, do not be grieving God's Holy Spirit with which you have been sealed for a day of releasing by ransom. So does it make sense to say you're grieving an active and personal force? No, it, grieving you, it sounds like something you do to people with emotions. So you can grieve the Holy Spirit because he has emotions. Now, what's interesting, Paul is echoing what the prophet Isaiah had already said the Israelites had done centuries earlier. Because in Isaiah 63, verse 10, what does it say the Israelites did to the Holy Spirit? The very thing Paul warned believers not to do. In Isaiah 63, verse 10. It says, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. He then turned into their enemy and he fought against them. And notice that this, this uh, cross-reference is right there in their own study Bible online at jw.org. Oh, wow. So they cross-reference Ephesians 4.30. Yes. So Isaiah, over 700 years before Paul, and Paul <laughs> 700 years later, all agree, both agree, because they're inspired by the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit can be grieved, whereas the Israelites grieved him. You Christians don't follow their example, so you better not grieve him. But grieving is an emotion. And you must be aware of what someone is doing in order to be affected by it. So the Holy Spirit was aware of Israel's rebellion, and it affected him and grieved him and saddened him. 
See? Right there. Yeah. So he has emotions. Now, here's where the Joe's Witnesses <clears throat> did not translate their own Greek text accurately, but let's look at it nonetheless. Romans 8, 26 to 27. <clears throat> Key text is 27. But we're going to look at it. It's on their website, interlinear. But first, let's go to their translation. Romans 8, 26, 27. In like manner, the Spirit also joins in with help for our weakness. For the problem is that we do not know what we should pray for as we need to, but the Spirit itself pleads for us with unuttered groanings. How can an impersonal force plead? Not, can't do that. So we cannot know how to pray because we're not aware of all the variables of what God's expressed will is for that specific situation. But the Holy Spirit knows all things. And he knows all variables and he knows what God's will. So he then comes over and guides you and prays through you in accord with God's will. He pleads. How can an impersonal force know to plead and what to pray for us? Finish it all the way to 27. But the one who searches the hearts knows what the meaning of the spirit is because it is pleading in harmony with God for the holy ones. You see how they deceived you there? Notice it says in 27, knows the meaning of the spirit. If you look at their inter interlinear, the word is, is not meaning, it's mind. He knows the minding, the thoughts in the mind of the spirit. But they mistranslated as meaning. So if you or go to their jw.org, near the end, you'll find the link to online Bible. And then you're going to see their interlinear. Guys, notice they said meaning. Oops. Watch what their own interlinear says, the word is. It's not Meaning it's mind or minding, meaning the thoughts in the mind. Oh, uh, okay. Interlinear. Yeah, the, uh, I'm, I got to look at the page with you. I think you found it, right? Let me see. Let me go on. I'm getting yeah. there. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. No, no. Take your time. I don't like their little chooser. <laughs> it doesn't work well for me. Find where Zoom is sometimes because I'm watching All you right. guys on YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, you got it. Okay, good. Now, if you go to 27... You see, it says minding fro fronima. Fronima. Even in their uh, translation, it's minding, meaning mind, the thoughts in the mind. So why did they render it as meaning? Why do you think they did that? To deceive the people who are reading uh, uh, the Jehovah Witnesses. Yep. To deceive. Precisely. In fact, here's what's interesting. That same word fronima appears in Romans 8, 6, and 7. Romans 8, 6, and 7. Okay. Romans 8, 6, and 7. You have a former Jehovah Witness. Caps lock. He goes, as a former JW elder, it's a joy to listen to truth. Glory to Jesus for you, brother. Now, Romans 8, 6. What's the word mind there? <clears throat> Franima. Wait, and how do they render it there? Minding. And then in their translation, it's mind. And, and again here. Franema, minding. And in seven. And in seven, franema, minding. Same word used four times in Romans 8. And the first three occurrences go back to their translation. They render franema as mind. But when it's used of the spirit, it's meaning now. Romans 8, 6 to 7. For setting the mind on the there flesh. There it goes. Setting How the come mind. there it's mind, Scott? Yeah, they've, they're, they're not being consistent in their hermeneutics because... As Jody said, they're trying to deceive the people who uh, rely on them for Bible teaching. Wow. So we just provided evidence from the Greek of Romans 8 that they use. Three times, phronema is translated mind. But the fourth time, when it's the mind of the spirit, they translate it as meaning. But now if we go with the meaning, phronema, God knows the mind of the spirit. How in the world can the Holy Spirit have a mind if he's not a person? That would be impossible to me. But the, God does know the mind of the Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is God in another dispensation or manifestation, how does this make sense? God the Father knows his own mind under a different mode? No, that doesn't work. So this kills two birds with one stone. It destroys the Joe Witness position and modalism. Right. That's what I was saying before. Yeah. All these, all these teachings, even though you know we're, we're, we're specifically answering the, the JWs, it, it deals with all those uh, other objections as well. Yeah, and one thing I want you to note, not only does God know the mind of the Spirit, but it says the Spirit knows how to pray in accord with God's will. 
Read 27. It's not meaning it's mine. So even with their translation, read what it says. And we're going to just render it as mine, not meaning. But the one who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because it is pleading in harmony with God for the holy ones. So the Holy Spirit pleads something that only persons do. And the Holy Spirit pleads in accord with God, meaning God's will, meaning he knows what God's will is and knows how to pray accordingly. And God knows the spirit's mind. So that proves the Holy Spirit is not God the Father, and he's not a force. He's a divine person distinct from God, yet one with him. Now, go to Romans 11.33 so we can learn about the depth of God, the depth of God. And we're going to make a segue into the Holy Spirit being Jehovah. Romans 11. Oh, the, de oh the depth of God's riches and wisdom and knowledge, how unsearchable his judgments are and beyond tracing out his ways are. So can you search the depths of God? No, humans can't because we have a finite mind and the, the mind of God is infinite. Neither can angels, right? Because they're finite and temporal, right? Amen. So no one, no creature, whether human or angelic, that's limited, bound time, space, and place, can search the depth of God because God is infinite in his mind. Possible. But now here's where I'm confused. The same Paul who said, no one can search or plummet the depths of God. Look what he says about the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 to 12. We're going to read 10 to 12. Chapter 2 in their translation, verses 10 to 12. Chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. 1 Corinthians. For it is to us, God has revealed them through his spirit. For the spirit searches into all things, even the deep things of God. How? How can an active force search anything? Because searching shows cognition and discernment. Because you got to know what you're searching for. Right? And then right. secondly... Since the depths of God are unsearchable, how does Holy Spirit search the deep things of God if he's not omniscient? Can't. So finish it. For who among men knows the things of a man except the man's spirit within him? So too no one has come to know the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we might know the things that have been kindly given us by God. The point being is, there's no one more qualified than the Son or the Spirit to perfectly reveal God. So guess what God did? He sent you the Holy Spirit, the only perfect teacher we have, because he is more than qualified to reveal God's plan, thoughts, and will for your life. Because he knows God comprehensively. He knows God fully because he knows the infinite mind of God. Therefore, he must be omniscient. So notice how it works. God the Father knows the mind of the Spirit. And the Spirit knows the thoughts within God's mind. Showing they're not the same person. They're distinct persons, but both of them are infinite omniscient. Because only an omniscient mind can know an omniscient person. That's so right. you have two birds, one stone here. The Holy Spirit is a person. Because he has to know what he's searching for. And the Holy Spirit has to discern what to reveal from the thoughts of God. And he must be omniscient. He must, be, he must know everything to know the things of God which are unsearchable. So right there you have clear proof. God and the Spirit are distinct but inseparable. Not same person but not separate beings. And both of them are omniscient. And the Spirit cannot be merely an active force. Now I can give more evidence for the personality of the Holy Spirit. But I think... This should suffice, unless you guys want a few more examples. And then we can now segue into the deity of the Holy Spirit, because this was an example of the deity of the Holy Spirit. In fact, let me give you one more example of the Holy Spirit being a person, because here it talks about the Holy Spirit having will. And it uses the same Greek word used of Jesus, that Jesus has a will. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. This talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, the one and same Spirit, has given to all the members of the body of Christ. The variety of gifts come from one spirit, not different spirits. But now notice what it says about the spirit's will, volition, desire. But all these operations are performed by the very same spirit, distributing to each one respectively, just as it wills. So even though it gives you the word it, it says it wills. The Holy Spirit has a will. So who chooses, who discerns, what gift? 
a particular individual will receive the Holy Spirit. It's his will, his desire, his choice, what gift you receive. Will. Now that word for will, that same Greek word is used by Jesus in Luke 10, 22. Luke 10, 22. All things have been handed over to me by my father, and no one knows who the son is except the father, and no one knows who the father is except the son, and anyone to whom the son is willing to reveal him. Guess what that word is willing is? Same word, use of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. So the Holy Spirit wills and the son wills. And you want to convince me the Holy Spirit is not a person, but Jesus is? It doesn't work. None of it this works. Is, this just Job Witness translation, as perverted as it is. And, and another thing I noticed, Sam, some of the other uh, passages that you read demonstrate the volition of the Spirit because he chose Barnabas and Saul, yes. not any of the other disciples. He chose where that they would go to Cyprus and whatever that other place was. I yeah, forgot. Well, Lucia, he's the one who decides this is where you're going to go. This is what you're going to do. And who you're going to do it to. I decide. That's a choice. And not only that, he discerned, along with the other apostles, these commands are better than the others. Well, discernment means cognition. Well, that's, that's it. I'm game over for the Joe Witness if they're going to be considered. Now, Agreed. I'm not that naive, and I don't want the Christians to be naive. Arguments don't convince anyone. You can show mm -hmm. them this till they turn blue in the face, or you turn blue in the face. You got to ask the Spirit to penetrate through their brainwashing and defenses so that though as you're talking to them they don't show any impression of being dented you don't know the war they're going to be experiencing internally that's only known to the spirit so say holy spirit keep these verses afresh in their minds and hearts don't let them ignore them and walk away from them so the verses will keep pounding them and haunting them until they finally break yeah that's a good point we can't convert anyone the spirit converts we don't yeah, I, it doesn't. I, and I, I know it because for over a year and a half, I was allowing a Jehovah Witness elder and his wife teach me. He had been a Jehovah Witness for 10 years, and he was a pediatrician by trade. He had his own medical um, office. Very affluent, I mean, well off. And yet, he spent over 50 hours a month in that cold Chicago winter, staying outside, going door to door as a faithful Jehovah Witness elder. And his wife was a Jehovah Witness for 30 years. And no matter what questions I asked, it didn't dent them. And I, and I brought up these points, but I didn't come to chat. One thing about Joe's Witnesses, you got to learn the do's and don'ts. The Joe Witnesses are trained, only the 144,000 know the Bible. The 144,000 anointed class, this book is for them, and they alone have Holy Spirit to discern it. It's not for the masses. And they alone are qualified. So if you're not a Joe Witness, you can't know the Bible. And if you're a Joe Witness who's not part of the anointing class, you need them to teach you the Bible. So the worst mistake people make is tell Joe's Witnesses what the Bible means. Because they're already trained. You're part of Christendom under an influence of Satan. You don't know what it means. We have to tell you. So I learned by going to their meetings, the most effective way of witnessing to them is ask questions. Never tell them, but ask. Because they actually have sessions where they teach Joe's Witnesses how to share and how not to do it. They even have classes on that, how to, you know, speech, yeah. what to emphasize, what to say, how not to say it. And they emphasize, ask questions, ask questions and answer questions. So if you want to be effective more so, ask them questions. Never tell them what a text means. Say, hey, what about this text? Look what it says here. I'm kind of a little confused and leave it be. Don't press it. Give them enough verses where you ask them questions to leave an indelible mark by the Spirit. But never and, tell them what it means because they're going to shut you down. Right. The walls come up. And remember also that if a JW goes out of the organization and becomes a Christian, they're going to have to be willing to give up their families, their mother, their fathers, their brother, their cousins. So they're losing a lot to come to Christ. So just remember that as well, because they will get shunned if they become a Christian. So, And by the way, you guys are blessed. You have another former Joe Witness, ex-Joe Witness here named Ken Narita. Ken, if you or Caps are willing to come on their channel, if they want you to, or mine, or both, oh. I'll have you on too. 
to share yeah. your testimony, how you left, Joe's Witnesses, we'll do that. I'll have you on my channel, even on theirs, if they want you, because we want to hear former Joe's Witnesses tell us their journey. I should have asked you earlier, because Ken is one of my regulars. I forgot, because I got so much on my plate, but I want to bring you on. He said, that's right, Sam. That's how it got me by asking. See what he said? Right. That's how he left, because they were asking, and that troubled him. So pray for Ken and Caps, who left the Joe's Witnesses for the true God, but I'm sure they lost many family members. Here, Caps Lock, the other former Joe's Witness. Yes, most JWs are scared for arguments. See? Here, here, you're hearing it from two Joe, former Joe's Witnesses. And thank the Lord for you that tells you Jesus is almighty to save, and he's even saving Joe's Witnesses and bring them to the truth. Glory to God. Okay, so Amen. now... I think hey, hey Sam, bef just before we move on, there was a question in the chat that I wanted sure, to share. Go ahead, as I get water. Go ahead. All right. Servant of, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Servant of Jesus asks, do all Unitarian groups believe the Holy Spirit is just a force? Yes. Yeah. Well, you have a variety of Unitarian groups. Some will tell you the Holy Spirit is simply God's presence, God the Father's own personal presence that fills the earth. Some will say the Holy Spirit is another name for God the Father, and some will say it's his force. They're not unanimous. There's not a unanimous view because the Unitarians, there are a variety of Unitarians, and they're not all in perfect agreement on all the essentials. The one thing they do agree on is that Trinity is false and Jesus isn't God. That they're assured of. Everything else, they're working out their theology over time. So you hear some of them saying the Holy Spirit is the presence of God. Similar to some rabbinic statements where they say the Shekinah, the presence of God is equated with the Holy Spirit. Even though in rabbinic Judaism, the Holy Spirit speaks to God and prays to God. So they're personally distinct. Others will say it's his force that he uses to influence people. And others say Holy Spirit is simply another name for God the Father. There, go figure. Uh, yeah, I had a quick question, Sam. Like you were saying the Holy Spirit sometimes is in the Greek, like it. And, no, not, and, not so much in the Greek. The word spirit itself is a neuter. Pneuma okay. in Greek is neuter. It's not masculine nor feminine. Okay. But in Hebrew, ruach is feminine. And the word for spirit in Hebrew is ruach, feminine. That means you can't determine the gender of the subject by the use of the noun. Because if I go with the Hebrew, the Holy Spirit is female. If I go with the Greek, it's neither male nor female. It's genderless. Okay. So that's not how languages work, so we need to be careful. When in chapter 16 of John where he speaks, he hears, yeah. he stands, uh, is that he, is that um, an it or is that? I a, believe it's the Greek word ekinos, and that would be masculine, but that doesn't prove your case. Okay, so you would. Thing. You can't argue on the basis of the pronouns. That doesn't help. Bandit okay, so, so you wouldn't emphasize the word he in that passage. Why would I? When I just showed you in Proverbs okay. 8, wisdom is called the she and a her. Okay. But this, is wisdom a female? All right, I understand. This, right. this is a, I think this is an important point that we need to talk about because our society has become gender obsessed because of the whole <laughs> gender activist uh, lobby. But, you know, uh, before, say, 1960, only words had gender. People never had gender. This is a new invention of our modern society. So, you know, just because, and, and, and we are confused as English speakers, especially those of us who are English only speakers, we don't, you know, we're not familiar with languages that have gendered uh, um, pronouns and nouns, but none of, none of those, most of those languages don't specify that, you know, every word that is, is, is gendered male is, is a male object or, or a thing. Sam touched on this already. Or that every word that's female is, is a female thing. Or that every word that, that uses a neuter or a common or whatever of the other one is, is therefore some kind of, of neuter thing. So we don't recognize that because we're not familiar with that language. But, you know, the point you're making is excellent, Sam. We cannot use this. It's not good for their side of the argument, nor is it good for our side mm -hmm. to use the, the gender of these nouns or pronouns to indicate the, you know, the gender of the thing. Of course, when we're talking about God, God doesn't have gender. Gender is a category that doesn't even apply to God. So yep. if it's we also gender nonsense in that way. Creation, yeah. If gender is limited to the physical creation, obviously God is not physical by nature. So that's, in fact, just to remind Jody, do you remember 
Taylor, uh, was it Taylor? I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Stewart, is it? What, what's his name? The gentleman I debated or dialogued with on your channel. Oh, Stacy Turbeville. Stacy. Man, I don't remember these names. But anyway, <laughs> do you remember he said that prior to 1611, English translation John 1 said, the word is in it. Yes, I remember He's that. He's using your argument in reverse to show, see, it's in oh, it. Got you. Do you remember? He mentioned that. I remember that. He mentioned it with Matt Slick, and he mentioned it with Anthony Rock. Right, now remember. The word is an it. It's not a he. It's not a he. It's an it. And you also took him to that John, I think, chapter four, where you was talking about what? Yeah, that was the other gentleman as well. That was the gentleman before him right. where I used it. So what's my point? He's using the same argument you're using, but in the reverse. Right. You're saying Holy Spirit is he. He's a person. And he's saying the word is in it, and he's not a person. That's not how language works. You can't use it that way. Okay. And this comes from trial and error. Don't think I came out of my mother's womb being a scholar or a theologian. I learned this because I made mistakes early on and I learned. Uh oh, wow. Never thought about that one. Now I learn. Thank the Lord I'm not going to use it again. So Amen, we brother. But here, from my mistakes, I can prevent you from making those mistakes. So we learn Absolutely. from each other. Right? Um, hey, uh, Jody, I made that mistake. Don't make it again. Or if you made a mistake, Sam, I made that mistake. This is the response. Don't make it again. That's how we learn. Iron sharpens iron. But the arguments I gave you are spiritually battle-tested arguments. They're irrefutable. They can't, I'm telling you, they can't. All they're going to say is, well, it doesn't mean that you don't know the Bible. You're not part of doing the class, or your Bible's corrupt if you're a Muslim. Well, we really appreciate you sharing your experience with us, Sam, and with our audience. Many so. times. That's why we're here. Serve one another for the sake well, of the Lord. Amen. Right. If you want to transition into proving from the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the Holy Spirit is Jehovah God especially for those particular cults, anti-Trinitarians who don't think so. Because the only, the Joseph has already believed he's eternal, that he's uncreated. So you don't need to prove the eternality of the spirit. What you need to prove is he's a person. Now they're stuck. Well, we already know he's eternal. He's uncreated. But now that he's a person, now we got a problem because that's two eternal, uncreated, divine persons. So what do we do with that? That's what you want them to start thinking. You don't need to prove to them the Holy Spirit has no beginning. They know the Holy Spirit has no beginning because he's God's force, and God has never existed without his active force. But once you now get them to admit it's not merely a force, he's a per Oh, by the way, I do need to deal with some of the common objections they use to show the Spirit is not a person. Thank the Lord. Let me do that because I gave a positive case, but let me show you their arguments against the Spirit being a person and how it proves absolutely nothing. I got to do that, and then we'll go into the deity of the Holy Spirit, and then I think— We've done a thorough job after that. Right. Okay. Right. Some of the arguments that they will tell you that shows the Holy Spirit can't be a person. He's poured out upon people. You don't pour out a person. Well, this assumes the Holy Spirit is a person like us. So, yeah, and you know, you can't take my, me physically, pour me out. But even then, Paul says he was poured out metaphorically. How can you tell me what a divine person can and cannot do? How do you know a divine person can't be poured out in the sense that he comes upon people to influence them? So one objection, the Holy Spirit is poured out. Joel 2, 27, 28, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So that's Joel 2, 28, 29, I'm sorry. Joel 2, 28, 29, which is quoted in Acts 2, 17, 18. You don't need to bring that up, brother. But Acts 2, verses 17, 18, quoting Joel 2, 28, 29, where God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, all sorts of flesh in those days. See, poured out. Well, if that means the Holy Spirit can't be a person, neither can the Messiah. Because in Isaiah 53, 12, we're told that the Messiah will pour out his soul even unto death. In Isaiah 53, verse 12. See? What does it say there? All right, we're navigating. Forgive me. Do, 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 do. Busy wait, busy wait. That's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. For that reason, I will assign him a portion among the many, and he will apportion the spoil with the mighty, because he poured out his life even to death. And was numbered among the transgressors, right? Made intercession yes. to the transgressors? Yes, and was counted among the transgressors. He carried the sin of many people, and he interceded for the transgressors. So since Jesus Christ poured out his soul unto death, he was poured out unto death, he can't be a person according to that logic. Does that Doesn't make sense? Work? No, it never works with these people. Exactly. Now go to Philippians 2.17. See what Paul says about himself. Yeah. 
Yeah, I got my cat here. Needs attention. So. Okay, be sure and pet the cat. Yep. However, even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and the holy service to which your faith has led you, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. So you just proved that Paul is not a human person because he was poured out as a drink offering. Of what course about, he's human. No, well, no. According to the Jehovah's Witness logic, no, he can't be because he's poured out. What about no. 2 Timothy 4 verse 6? <clears throat> uh, their site is running slow it's not my fault yeah, no i'm sorry we're not we're not <laughs> yeah 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 okay second timothy 4 6 for i am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my releasing is imminent that's it paul's not a person he's poured out nonsense so some someone can be poured out without this depersonalizing him. So if Jesus can be poured out, Paul can be poured out, poured out, there's still persons. Why can't the Holy Spirit be poured out and still be a person? Because that's metaphorical language. Pouring out meaning the Holy Spirit is being sent to empower God's servants to live the godly life and remain faithful to Christ. It's simply what we call a metaphor to refer to something else. The other objection is, well, people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Like in Acts 4 verse 8, it says, Peter filled with Holy Spirit. You can't be filled with another person. Well, if you can't be filled with a person, you just prove Jehovah is not a person. Because go to Jeremiah 23, verses 23 to 24. Jeremiah 23, verses 23 to 24. So if this argument that being filled with the Holy Spirit means he can't be a person because you can't be filled with another person, it proves too much because it proves Jehovah is not a person. Jeremiah 23, 23, 24, guys, pay attention to what the text says, what Jehovah says. Am I only a God nearby, declares Jehovah, and not a God also from far away? Can any man hide in a concealed place where I cannot see him, declares Jehovah? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? That's it. Scott, he fills heaven and earth. He can't be a person because you can't be filled with a person. Well. Right? Their logic, yeah, yeah. their argument. I'm not. I, I didn't bring up the arm. They did. Well, let's see. Let's see Jesus and God the Father. Do Jesus and God the Father fill all things? Go to Ephesians one. Speaking of our Lord, it's in verse twenty three. Says our Lord, He's the head of the body, the congregation. Their translation in Ephesians one twenty three, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills up all things in all. So Jesus fills the body with his fullness? Yes. So he yep. can't be a person. What about Ephesians 3.19? So I hope you guys seeing their objections are weak. They have no good case. Ephesians 3.19, their own Bible version, guys. And to know the love of the Christ, which surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness that God gives. So God fills you with his fullness. And Jesus fills us with his fullness. And then Jehovah fills heaven and earth. And then in Ephesians 4, 7 to 10, the key verse is 10. But so we can see that it's Jesus in context. Ephesians 4, verses 7 to 10. Jesus fills heaven and earth, just like Jehovah does. Now, undeserved kindness was given to each one of us according to how the Christ measured out the free gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he carried away captives, he gave gifts in men. Now, what does the expression he ascended mean, but that he also descended into the lower regions, that is the earth? The very one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might give fullness to all things. So Jesus ascended above the heavens to fill all things, all creation, right there, their translation. Now, if being filled with the Spirit or having Spirit poured out means he's not a person, the Jehovah's Witness has just proved Jehovah is not a person, the Father is not a person, Jesus is not a person, and Paul is not a person, because Jesus and Paul poured out their souls, their lives, even unto death. Jesus and God the Father fill all things with their fullness, and Jehovah says, I fill heaven and earth, Therefore, none of them are persons. Terrible way of arguing because it shows they don't know how to exegete the Bible. But a side note for 
my Trinitarian brothers and sisters. Notice what Paul just said about Christ. He descended to the lower parts of the earth, and then he ascended above the heavens, fulfilling a psalm. Paul quotes Psalm 68, 18, and he says Jesus fulfilled the psalm. The psalm where it says, when you ascended on high, you took cap captivity captive to bestow gifts on men. Psalm 68, 18, Paul applies to Jesus ascending above the heavens physically after his resurrection, after first descending to pay our debt of sin, reconcile us to God, and uh, then bestow these gifts, these spiritual gifts. So who fulfilled Psalm 68, 18, according to Paul? Jesus, right? Right. But here's the problem, Scott. Psalm 68, 18 is about Jehovah ascending on high after coming down during the Exodus. Why is Paul applying a text about Jehovah ascending after taking captivity captive at the Exodus and applying it to Jesus if Jesus is not Jehovah? Jesus is Jehovah. And that's why Paul quoted a text about Jehovah and applied it to Jesus. And then the second characteristic that Paul just applied to Jesus, which we saw as a characteristic of Jehovah. You read Jeremiah 23, 24, where it says, Jehovah fills heaven and earth. But right now you just read, it is Jesus who descended to the earth, ascended far above the heavens to fill all things, all creation, heavens and earth with his fullness. How can Paul say of Jesus that Jesus does what Jehovah does, fill heaven and earth with his fullness? He would so have Paul to be omnipresent. Good, yes. Paul took a passage about Jehovah ascending and applied it to Jesus ascending. And Paul took the language of Jehovah that he fills heaven and earth and applied it to Jesus filling heaven and earth. And yet you still want me to believe, Jehovah Witnesses do, that Jesus is not Jehovah in the flesh. It doesn't work. That's that's what we just keep coming up with. Their theology now, doesn't work. Now, some degree. of them may be very desperate and say, well, see, the Holy Spirit indwells you, and therefore you can't be a person. You can't be indwelt by a person. In case you hear that argument, that again shows God the Father and Jesus Christ can't be persons. Why? Because the Bible says God the Father indwells believers. Jesus Christ also indwells believers. So if being in you means you can't be a person, then Jesus is not a person and the Father is not a person. Because I want you to go to Colossians 1, 27. Colossians 1, 27. And then these are their objections. I will go into the deity of the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1, 27. So watch here. To whom God has been pleased to make known among the nations the glorious riches of this sacred secret, which is Christ in union with you, the hope of his glory. Now, that's okay. They rendered it in union. Literally, it's a preposition in, meaning in you. And the idea is that he's in relationship to you. So, is Jesus in you, in union with you? Yes. Well, if being in you means you can't be a person, then Jesus can't be a person. Now, go to Romans 8, verses 9 to 10. Romans 8, verses 9 to 10, it's the same preposition, in, E-N, in, 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 which means in union with you. But the problem is they don't translate it consistently. At times, they'll render it as in you, and other times, in union with you. But now go to Romans 8, verses 9 to 10. However, you are in harmony, not with the flesh, but with the Spirit. If See, God's the word spirit harmony. Now, again, as a paraphrase of the preposition, it's right, because to be in the Spirit or have the Spirit in you, doesn't mean the Spirit is materially in you like water is in a cup, because the Spirit is immaterial. It means the Holy Spirit is in union with you, working in relationship with you to guide you and empower you, and you are yielding to the Spirit's influence. So as a paraphrase, they're capturing the meaning. But literally, the preposition in means in. So you are not in the flesh if you are in what? If God's Spirit truly dwells in you, so who's dwelling in you? God's spirit, right? Yes. Okay, but now I'm confused because read the second part. But if anyone does not have Christ's spirit, this person does not belong to him. You confused me, Scott. I thought mm -hmm. you had God's spirit in you, but it says if you don't have Christ's spirit, you don't belong to Christ. So whose spirit is in you? The spirit of God or the spirit of Christ? Both. There's no conflict for Trinitarians. So the Holy Spirit belongs to God and Christ, which is why we're Trinitarian. The Holy Spirit 
that belongs to Christ is the Holy Spirit that belongs to God, and their Holy Spirit is in us. Wow. And then now read verse 10, because now notice how they don't translate the same word in Greek in the same way here. But if Christ is in union with you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. It's the same Greek preposition that they render in when it says God's spirit in you. Here it says Christ is in you. But then it says it's God's spirit in you. But then it says it's the spirit in the spirit of Christ in you. So who's in us? God's spirit, Christ's spirit, or Christ? All of the above. Because when the Holy Spirit indwells you, he's mediating the presence of the Father and the Son. So the spirit being in you is the son being in you and the father being in you because all three persons are in union in relationship with all believers and we must yield to all three. Now, just so I can show the brothers here, it's the same Greek preposition. Would you mind opening up the JW interlinear? All right, we're still there. Okay. Um... Okay, here it is. Dwelling in you, the first one. Oike and humin. Yeah, and you see? Humin, in you. And the preposition. So notice their interlinear renders and the preposition as in, right? Right. Now, does the preposition change? What is the next one? Keep going. So it says, uh, but if anyone, Spirit of Christ, pneuma, Christu, uk, ike. But notice in verse 10, if but Christ in you. Same word, mean. right? Yeah. Christos and humin. Yeah, so the same preposition in. Same. So literally, it's God's spirit is in you, which is Christ's spirit, and which is Christ in you. So if the spirit can't be a person because he's in you, then Christ can't be a person because he's in you, and you're in him. I hope I establish the point, because I can give you other references, like 2 Corinthians 13, 5, test to see if Jesus Christ is in you. And I can give you John 14, 20 to 21, and John 17, 20 to 23. But I think it's clear Everything said about the Spirit is said about the Father, the Son, and human persons. So if this proves the Spirit is in a person, then it denies the personhood of the others. Nonsense. So I hope you see that's their best arguments against the deity of the Holy Spirit. They're pathetically bad. So if you want, let's segue into some just brief examples showing the Holy Spirit. We've already established he's a person. He has a mind. He has emotions. He has a will. He uses I, you distinction, I send you, set apart them for me, right? And he hears from the Father and the Son and only teaches what he hears from them, showing he's not the Father, not the Son. They're all distinct, but he's united to the Father and the Son and that the Father and the Son have the authority to send out the Spirit and command him to teach the church. So that shows they're not the same person, but they're not distinct, different gods. But where do we find proof that the Holy Spirit is God? Oh, this is going to be easy. You go to Isaiah 6. Let's start with Isaiah 6. Read verses 8 to 10. Because I want you to see who's speaking to who. Isaiah 6, verses 8 to 10. Do we have to use their translation? <laughs> you want to okay. change? It's up to you. Because I, I think right now we've shown people you can use their translation. In certain places, but if you want to change it, go ahead. Don't worry about it. We don't yeah, need only because think... only because their site is running slowly. All right, go ahead. Oh, change. All right, Isaiah six verse eight. Then I heard the voice of Jehovah saying, "Whom shall I send, and who will go for us?" And I, I said, the "Distinction, I us." The voice of Jehovah said, "Who will I send? Go for us." That us is important. I unity, us plurality. So then, what does Isaiah say? What does he respond? And I said, here I am, send me. And he replied, go and say to this people, you will hear again and again, but you will not understand. You will see again and again, but you will not get any knowledge. Make the heart of this people unreceptive, make their ears unresponsive and paste their eyes together so that they may not see with their eyes and hear with their ears so that their heart may not understand and they may not turn back and be healed. Now, pay attention. The speaker is the voice of Adonai, the Lord, who's Jehovah in the context. Jehovah said these words, right? Right. Okay, but now in Acts 28, Acts 28, 25 to 27. Acts 28, verses 25 to 27. According to Paul, who said these words that you just read in Isaiah 6, 9 and 10? 
Isaiah says, that's Jehovah, whom I saw with my physical eyes in a visible shape, visible body, wearing a visible robe on a visible throne. That's Isaiah 6, 1 to 5. So that was Jehovah's voice who told them. But now notice, Paul says, the words of Isaiah 6, 9 to 10 were spoken by whom? Acts 28, 25 to 27. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, and their ears they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So who said those words? Isaiah. Read, read the, spirit, the Spirit, oh, the Holy, Spirit, the Holy through spirit. Isaiah. Okay, wait, I'm confused, Scott. You read in Isaiah 6, it was Jehovah. That's right. But here, Paul says, the Jehovah who told Isaiah to say these words is who? The Holy Spirit. So how can the Holy Spirit speak if he's a force, and how does he speak as Jehovah? Doesn't work. And the same way it reads in the New World Translation. Now, a couple more examples. Go to Jeremiah 31, verses 33 to 34. Whose words are these? In Jeremiah 31, verses 33 to 34. It's Yahweh speaking. Well, read it and see. You're going to see now another connection with the Holy Spirit being Jehovah or Yahweh or Yahovah. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those day days, declares the Lord. So the I Jehovah speaking declares the Lord. I will make the covenant, declares the Lord Jehovah. Keep going. I will put my spirit, or I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So it's the Lord Jehovah saying, I will write my laws in their hearts. It's my covenant that I will make. And I will forgive their sins and remember their lawless deeds no more, because only God can forgive. So it's Jehovah, right? Right. But in Hebrews 10, verses 15 to 17, who said these words? Hebrews 10, verses 15 to 17. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after, after those who days. After this? After the Holy Spirit bears witness about this. So the Holy Spirit says, I will make... My covenant, it's the Holy Spirit's covenant now? Says I, I will make. Okay, keep going. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. So the Holy Spirit adds, I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more, meaning the Holy Spirit forgives sins. Yes. Yes. So why does why does the author of Hebrews, by inspiration, apply the words of Jehovah from Jeremiah 31, 33, 34 to the Holy Spirit, thereby having the Spirit saying, it's my covenant that I make with them, my laws that I write in their hearts, says the Lord, and I, the Holy Spirit, won't remember their sins, lawless deeds anymore, meaning the Spirit forgives, something only God can do. Because the Holy Spirit is Jehovah. Who speaks and forgives. Right. And creates and saves because he is God. And this is how it reads in the Joe Witness Bible. One more example. In Psalm 95, 7 to 11. Well, I'll let you read it. Go ahead. You'll see. Because you're going to see these words are attributed to the Holy Spirit again. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. So God is speaking in third person and first person. Do not put the Lord to test where your fathers put me to the test, even though they saw my miracle. So God is speaking now. Now keep reading. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Hmm. So that's Jehovah speaking. But now go to Hebrews 3, verses 7 to 11. Who uttered these words? Hebrews 3, verses 7 to 11. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. 
on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Wait, whose rest is it? Whose wrath? Whom do they test? Whom do they disturb? According to Hebrews 3, 7, 11? The Holy Spirit. So why is the author again, having the Holy Spirit, utter the words of Jehovah God, where the Holy Spirit is that Jehovah who said those words of the psalmist? Because he's Jehovah again, God. He's, the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. And, and yet Jehovah. he speaks, so he's not an active force. So these verses are in the New World Translation. few more on the deity of Christ. And I think we made a thorough defense, biblically, exegetically. The Holy Spirit is not a creature. He's not impersonal. He's an eternal divine person who's one with the Father and the Son because he's not the Father and the Son. Other passages that show the Holy Spirit doing what only God does. Create, give life, and sustain. Create, give life, and sustain. Go to Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So who made man? God's Spirit. Spirit. And this actually is an interpretation of Genesis 1, 26, 27, where it says, God said, let us make man. Here Job tells you who God was speaking to. The Spirit of God has made me. Let us make man. And that ties in not only with Genesis 1, 26, it ties in with Genesis 1, 2, because there you're already told the Spirit of God was hovering over the watery deep. So Job 33, 4 tells you that God was speaking to the Spirit because the Spirit of God was there when the earth was in its prebiotic stage to now give life to the earth. So God said to the Spirit, let us make man in our image. So the Spirit of God has made me. Wow, that's an echo of Genesis 1, verse 2 and Genesis 1, 26, 27. So here's proof, Trinitarians, that God wasn't talking to the angelic host. He was talking to the Spirit who was already there, the Spirit of God, and telling the Spirit, you and I together, let us make man in our image. The Spirit of God has made me. And that's why it also echoes Genesis 2, 7, because it's in Genesis 2, 7, where it says God fashioned the man from dust and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. So here the breath of life is the breath of the Almighty. And his breath is equated with the spirit. So here you have a text explaining and combining Genesis 2, 7, Genesis 1, 2, and 26, thereby affirming the spirit of God was the one that God spoke to. And the spirit of God is the breath that God sends forth to animate human beings by giving them living souls. Another passage where the Holy Spirit creates, recreates, sustains, and gives life. Psalm 104, 29 to 30, specifically verse 30. Psalm 104, you, 104, 29 to 30. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Now, breath when, actually in Hebrew is ruach. When you take away their spirit, they die and return to dust, which God said. You die when your spirit leaves your body, you return to the dust. It's ruach. So when you take away their spirit, that human spirit that animates them was produced by the Holy Spirit. When it leaves... Their body returns to dust. But then when God wants to resurrect, recreate them in the earth, what does he do? When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. And edits can also mean earth. So notice, God used the Holy Spirit to create life, produce life, to make man. And God uses that same Holy Spirit to recreate, resurrect men who have died, whose spirits have left their bodies, and to replenish the earth. The only way the Holy Spirit can do that is if he's almighty, all-knowing, present everywhere, creator, maker, fashioner, potter, sustainer, life giver. Right? You see it. Amen. Right? Yes. Okay. Second, hey, Sam, uh, just one thing before we move on. Uh, you said Eretz, but I'm finding that the word for ground here is Adama. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that what it is? In, is that Greek or Hebrew? Let me check. This You're is the Hebrew. Right. Okay, good, brother, because sometimes we but go with uh, memory. Earth, earth is it is a possible translation of that, but it means you know earth, dirt, soil. Oh yeah, Adama, not Adama, planet. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. my apologies. See, thank you. See, glory to God that the Holy Spirit corrects us on the spot, so we don't misinform. Adama does mean the ground, but it means from the earth from which man came. Adama is where you get Adam. Adam from Adama because he came from the dust of the ground. But be that as it may, it's speaking of the ground in general. So that would right. be the earth in general. So thank you. Edits can mean earth or ground or land, same as Adama. 
Adam from Adama. Adam was made from Adama, the ground, the soil, the dust, the earth. Dust. So, here's here's the that word for dust, by the way, afar, the same same word that's used of the Adam made from the dust of the ground. I'm pretty sure, but I'm operating from memory. It's, so it's somebody called, check it's me. Called, <laughs> it's called what they call play on words, pun on words. Adam, Adama, like even right. Edom. Edom means he's ruddy, right? right. And Esau means he's hairy. These are uh, the, the biblical language, the Hebrew. It is a fascinating language that has great depth and beauty because you'll find a lot of play on mm -hmm. words. Yeah. Moses is called Moses because he was drawn out of the water because Moshe means to draw out. Or Isaac was called Isaac because he, Abraham laughed and Sarah laughed and Isaac means laughter. See, this mm -hmm. is how Hebrew works. There's play or puns on names that are very rich that are absent from your English translations unless you have a good commentary that brings it out. Right? Yeah. It's super in-depth, the Bible. It is oh, The Bible itself is a proof, a living proof that the God of the Bible is real. It's a miraculously structured book preserved by the Lord. But sometimes in English, you don't see those nuances that are there in the Hebrew, Aramaic, or the Greek. But that's okay. That doesn't mean you can't learn who God is. So I'm not trying to discourage you. Oh, well, no, no, no. I'm just saying. These play on words are amazing in the original languages. Adama. Adam came from Adama ground. That's why he's Adam. Edom means ruddy because he was ruddy in appearance. Esau because he's hairy. It says, when Esau came out, he was hairy. So they called him Esau, meaning hairy. So his name was technically hairy. Hey, hairy. <laughs> Yeah. Jacob, why did he was he called Jacob? Yaakov means to supplant because he was he was grasping at the heel almost to like push Esau out of the way. So Jacob can mean deceiver or supplanter. See, all these names are puns on play on certain characteristics which they possess or <clears throat> from which they originate. But anyway, thank you, brother. I needed that because I don't want to make mistakes, but that's OK. We're being perfected. The closest thing to infallibility is Jody. So we're not there yet. <laughs> no. Far from that, brother. Far from that. So, but we did get the point. The Holy Spirit made man. He is God's breath because God doesn't literally have physical breath. So breath is a metaphor. Because when you think breath, you think life. You don't breathe, you die. So God's breath is his Holy Spirit that gives you breath, gives you life, creates a soul and spirit within you to animate you. So he is the breath. He's the spirit who gives life and breath to all. So the Holy Spirit is creator, life giver, preserver, sustainer. So right there you see it, Job 33 verse 4 with Psalm 104, 30. Is he expressly called God? Go to 2 Samuel 23 verses 2 to 3. 2 Samuel 23 verses 2 to 3. The spirit of Yahweh speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God. And I'm really confused. I mean, you keep confusing me today, Scott. In verse 2, it says, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. So the Holy Spirit speaks. Yep. And his word is on my tongue. So David was aware that it's the Holy Spirit who's teaching me, speaking to me, telling me what to say. So I'm uttering his words and writing them down. So this is an Old Testament text. A thousand years before our Lord, David knew fully that I am speaking and writing down the words of God from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is telling me, speaking to me, and telling me what to write. So it's the Holy Spirit who speaks and instructs and inspires prophets. So he's a person. But then where I get confused, he says, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. It's his word, the Spirit's word on my tongue. But then verse 3 told you, the God of Israel said, and the rock of Israel spoke. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said. So who spoke? The God of Israel? Who's the rock of Israel? Or the Holy Spirit? Both. The Spirit right. of Yahweh is the God of Israel. Right. So David right. knew that? Yes, he knew that. And that's in the Job Witness translation as well. David knew when the Holy Spirit speaks, that's the God of Israel speaking, the rock of Israel. And he knew the Holy Spirit is a person who speaks and instructs and inspires because he's instructing and inspiring me. To reveal the words of God and record them. Right? Right. right. So here you go. Spirit is called the God of Israel, the rock of Israel. Spirit creates. Spirit gives life. The spirit resurrects, recreates, replenishes, renews creation. Means he's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, 
because only one who's all powerful oversees all things and is aware of all things and can sustain all things can be creator preserver sustainer life giver and the resurrector regenerator replenisher of dead things and that's who the holy spirit is amen now, go to psalm 139 verse 7 i'll give two more references and i'll open up the q a if you want because i can be here all day but i think we've given enough information to whet people's appetites to go back seeking the holy spirit's face to show them more in psalm 139 verse 7 by the way verses 1 to 6 is all about the omniscience of god verses 1 to 6 Verses 7 to 12 is about the omnipresence of God. In Psalm 139, 7 to 12. And then verses 13, 16, is a, it's about the omnipotence of God in creating all life, fashioning all unborn children, and decreeing the length of days. So in Psalm 139, verses 1 to 16, you have omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, all in one section. But in Psalm 139, verse 7, what does it say about the Spirit? Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? Anywhere you go, the spirit is already there. Because it says, if I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I make my beds, my bed in Sheol, you are there. So here you have a clear reference, Holy Spirit being omnipresent. Just as present as God is all over creation. And that's Old Testament, guys. I'm not even quoting New Testament yet. So the Old Testament writers knew about the Holy Spirit, just like the New Testament writers do. In the New Testament, we have a more fuller, complete picture, but we still have a picture in the Old Testament, nonetheless, where these inspired men knew the Holy Spirit is almighty, all-knowing, present everywhere, a divine person who speaks and can be spoken to and instructs and teaches, and he's creator, sustainer, preserver, life giver, and savior. Now go to Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14, and I'll give you one more reference, and then that's it. We can then open up Q&A unless you want to dismiss. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Okay, now understand it's talking about the incomprehensibility, omniscience of the Holy Spirit. Can you measure out the spirit? No, he's immeasurable. That means he's infinite. And then what does it say about him? Because the pronouns refer to the spirit. What's the second part? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Who? Who did that? Who instructed the Holy Spirit? Who counseled the Holy Spirit? Who gave Holy Spirit knowledge and understanding? Nobody. Why? Why doesn't the Holy Spirit need anyone to instruct him? What's the implication? He knows everything. Oh, you mean Isaiah knew the Spirit is omniscient and infinite beyond measure, beyond comprehension? Yep. And the psalmist in Psalm 139 knew... The Holy Spirit is omnipresent? Yep. And David knew the Holy Spirit speaking is the God of Israel speaking, and he's inspiring me. How much did these people know? In fact, what's ironic, David, Isaiah, and the other prophets knew more about the Holy Spirit than these Unitarians and Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> and this is B.C., before Christ. Final one now to show the eternality of the Holy Spirit, because he even calls him the eternal spirit, eternal. Hebrews 9, 14. Here's the Trinity in action. Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So you have Jesus Christ offering himself as a sacrifice to God the Father in union with the eternal spirit. There's your Trinity. So is the spirit created or eternal? Eternal. So And it's... In union with the eternal spirit, because Jesus never acts or works apart from the Father and the Spirit. So the eternal spirit, in union with Jesus, was working with Jesus to Jesus offer himself as a sinless, unblemished sacrifice to God the Father, which the Father accepted. So there's God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, in flesh, the God-man, and the eternal spirit. Three and only three, there's your trinity. Amen. So let's end it by showing where... Paul even prayed to the Holy Spirit because many people don't know that the epistles begin with what we call a benediction invocation, invoking God to bless the churches. And then at the end of the epistle, a bened benediction. Now, let me show you a Trinitarian benediction where Paul ends an epistle, invoking God to bless the congregations who are reading the epistle to enable them to act upon 
these commands that God gave Paul to give to the churches. But I'm going to give you a parallel to it. Let's go to number 6, 22 to 26. Number 6, 22 to 26. The Aaronic priestly benediction. The prayer that the priest pronounced over the people of God. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his sh face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Is it, is it coincidental this is a triadic benediction? Instead of invoking the Lord twice, it, it invokes him three times? And it doesn't do it four times or five. Now, I'm not saying this is proof of the Trinity, but this is what we call side dressing. Once you provided the irrefutable exegetical, exegetical proof for the Trinity, such triadic patterns now make sense. Right. Right. So this is not a proof for the Trinity. It's what we call side dressing. Once you provided the overwhelming irrefutable exegetical evidence for the Trinity, these things come in as like dressing, right? Like, you know. Icing on the cake. Yes. It's triadic. Three times the Lord is invoked to bless his people. Now, let me show you the Trinity being prayed to invoked by Paul to bless the people of God. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's a prayer, Scott, Jody. He's invoking Jesus, God, and the Spirit to bestow these gifts and qualities upon the congregations. The grace, the favor of Jesus Christ rests upon you. The love that God has for you and the love that God fills you with for one another and him. And the fellowship you enjoy with the Spirit and the fellowship you enjoy with one another by the Holy Spirit be with you all. So Paul just prayed to the Spirit the same way he prayed to God the Father, the same way he prayed to Jesus Christ to bestow spiritual blessings on the church. So who told you you can't pray to the Holy Spirit? You can pray to all three persons in the same prayer. In fact, Paul would be blaspheming if Jesus isn't God because he put Jesus ahead of God in the prayer. If Jesus isn't God, but a creature, he insulted the majesty of God by mentioning a creature ahead of the creator. Blasphemy. And Paul was no blasphemer. This only makes sense if Paul was convinced that though Jesus is a man, he's truly God. And as God, he's equal to the Father in glory, essence, dignity, honor, and worship, as is the Holy Spirit. Amen, brother. Yeah. You get no argument here. <laughs> if anyone's going to be honest with Scripture, no one should be arguing with us. But we have hardened hearts, sinful proclivities, and Satan influencing humanity to refuse to accept God as he is and accept the Bible for what it says. But may the Holy Spirit is almighty over Satan and our sins and our flesh and stubbornness convict hearts to accept God as he is and be in love with him as God is in love with them in love with us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And they, they also have, you know, leaders who are mis, uh, misguiding them, blind guides feeding them. And unfortunately a lot of these people are um, in bondage to those, to those leaders. Yep, tools of Satan. So there yeah. you go, guys. Unless you have questions, we got a lot of meat. All glory to the Holy Spirit. Everything good and perfect we attribute to our God who lives, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Any mistakes, we blame ourselves. And I thank the Lord that he checked the Hebrew for me because I basically, if you guys don't know, I go by memory. And I pray God will perfect my ability to recall scripture perfectly. But again, we're going to make mistakes like we sin, sadly. But thank you, brother. Because I don't want to give wrong information because uh, sadly... What I like about Scott, he will go and double check. Most people will just take your word for it. And I don't like that. Go That's back right. and double check. Yeah. You can be a good Berean. Go back and examine what we've said is true. First, you know, Acts 17, 10 to 11. You need to do that because I'm not trying to mislead you, but I may be mistaken. I may have said something in error. Don't just take what we say. Go back, rewatch, and re-examine the passages. Oh, see, Sam made a mistake here. And it's not intentional. I'm not trying to mislead you. Only the Holy Spirit is perfect, and he uses imperfect vessels. I appreciate that about you, Sam, because I'm the same way. If I'm teaching and I make a mistake, I'd like someone to point that out yeah, to me, please. so I'll stop uh, misleading people. And uh, we, I, I think the only teachers that you ought to trust are the ones who say to you, don't believe me, go check this out. Yeah. And Amen. like you say, most people won't do it, unfortunately. 
Yeah, but when you do correct us, please be gentle. Don't come and attack <laughs> us and debate us and say, you heretic, you liar, you son of the devil. See, I knew you are just... Then you're asking for a fight. Then you're going to get us not to listen. Not <laughs> listening. La, la, la. Talk to the hand. But anyway. <laughs> well, I think that's enough for, for one day. There are no questions in the chat. Uh, I, I asked. And I think, you know, when you see the scriptures as plainly as you've, you've showed them to us, Sam, there's, there's no need for questions. Um, at least not in, you know, in terms of refutation questions or objections, um, perhaps clarification, but, um, this has been great. Let's okay, do well, it again. One objection. Caps mm -hmm. lock. He's a former Jehovah's witness. Mm -hmm. He says, well, see, they say you'll be baptized with the Holy spirit and fire since fire is not a person. The Holy spirit isn't cap lock. Thank you for that question. Okay, that right. means Jesus is not a person either because you're baptized into Christ and you're clothed with Christ just because you use a person and an impersonal force in the same sentence doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not a person. So let me repeat the objection. One argument I would like Sam to destroy is Matthew 3.11. When they said baptized by Holy Spirit and fire, since fire is not person, Holy Spirit can't be. Well, let me show you, Cap Flox, that you're also baptized into Christ and you put on Christ like a garment. So that means Jesus can't be a person. You can take a person with an impersonal characteristic and group them together for a specific point. Without implying that the Holy Spirit, solely because he's grouped with an impersonal force, can't be a person. Because that logic proves too much. And what about the reverse? What if I show you the Holy Spirit is grouped with two divine persons? Would that make him divine as well? Let me now refute that argument. Brother, go to Romans 13, 14. Romans 13, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. How can you put on Jesus Christ as clothing if he's a person? <laughs> That's silly. It's a metaphor. Now, go to Galatians 3, 27. Not only do you put on Christ, but you, you are baptized in Christ. How can you be baptized in a person? For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And it is into, the, the word in Greek is ace, dynamic preposition, into. into. So you are baptized into Christ and you put on Christ. How can I put Christ on and be baptized in him if he's a person? Well, he is a person and it's metaphorical. So just because the spirit is grouped with fire, you'll either be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit, because I believe that preposition is N. In the Holy Spirit, we can be rendered as with in Matthew 3.11 or fire. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not a person. It means your choice. Either you can have the Holy Spirit filling you, so you're flooded in his presence and power and connected to Christ, or you can have fire consuming you. But just because fire is used doesn't depersonalize the Holy Spirit, because if that logic is true, Caps, then the fact that you wear Christ, put on Christ, and are baptized into him, then that means Christ is not, is not a divine person. And after all, doesn't the Bible say God is a consuming fire? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12, 29. So if God is now said to be fire, and fire is impersonal, then God is impersonal. All right? He says that is perfect. And we have another question from another question. Sure. Uh, Viewer. Regiment Seraphim asks two questions. First, is Isaiah worshiping the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 40, verse 13? Yep. And uh, let's do that first and then do yeah, the second. That's where it says, who has measured the spirit of Jehovah? Depends on your definition of spirit. Uh, I'm saying not spirit, of worship. Worship entails not just glorifying God, lauding God, praising God, magnifying God, but also speaking God intimately and personally. So, yes, this is worship in that he's magnifying the Holy Spirit. And part of your worship is to magnify the Holy Spirit. Now, as far as Ezekiel 3.22 is concerned, the passage is in Ezekiel to use to show that the Holy Spirit is distinct from God, but one with him would be Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 2. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 2. Write these down, guys. There are too many. Ezekiel 3.24, which is connected to 22. Ezekiel 11, verse 5, Ezekiel 11, verse 5, because those passages say the Spirit came upon, entered in Ezekiel, and empowered him to see God and hear God audibly. So there you have the Holy Spirit, distinct from God, but he is the one that empowered Ezekiel by entering him, 
coming upon him and strengthening him to see God visibly and hear him audibly. Again, showing Ezekiel knew he needed the Holy Spirit to inspire him. Also, write down Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27. Ezekiel 37, 12 to 14, specifically verse 14, Ezekiel 37, 12 to 14, and Ezekiel 39, 29, because in those passages it says, God will pour out the Holy Spirit upon his people to change their hearts and give them a heart of flesh to enable them to walk in his commandments. What kind of attributes must the Spirit have to take an entire group of people and transform them and empower them to obey God, not sin against them? Well, he has to be all-powerful, all-wise, present everywhere. But then in Ezekiel 37, 12, 14, he says, I'll open up your graves and I'll put my spirit in you and you'll come to life. Even though this is a parable of a spiritual resurrection, it shows that it's the Holy Spirit who raises, resurrects spiritually and physically. He must be all powerful to do that to a whole mass of humanity. And that's confirmed in Ezekiel 39, 29, where it says God will put his spirit in all his people so they could live spiritually and physically before his sight. So there again, in Ezekiel, you have the Holy Spirit distinct from God, who's almighty, all-knowing, present everywhere, creator, sustainer, savior, life giver, regenerator. That's in Ezekiel, in all those verses. Now let's end it with Matthew 28, 19, because Caps, I'm now going to give you the reverse argument. If the Holy Spirit being group, uh, grouped with an impersonal force means the Holy Spirit can't be a person, then what do you do now with the Holy Spirit being grouped with two persons? That means if you're going to be consistent, he must be a person because he's grouped with two other persons under the same divine name. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Name singular. Name belonging to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Since the Father is a person and the Son is a person and both possess the divine name, does it make sense now to ascribe that same name to an impersonal force? No. So go baptize in the name of one person, a second mm -hmm. person, and a force. Yeah, that makes sense. And let's yeah. invoke a force along with one person and another person. The grace of Jesus Christ, a divine person who's flesh, the God-man. The love of God, God-Father, the divine person, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, a force. So Paul is praying to a force along with two divine persons. Yeah, that makes sense. I never finished reading uh, the the second question, yeah, so I just did. wanted I just want to do that, that so the people who are watching on YouTube the the replay will, will understand yeah. what's going on. That was Ezekiel can, twenty two, right? That he's, he's yes. There can we hand. use? He he asks, or I don't know who. <laughs> can we use Ezekiel three twenty two to show God and the Holy Spirit are of one essence? Yeah, so that's why I mentioned Ezekiel 3, 24, Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 2, Ezekiel 11, verse 5, as well as Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, specifically 27, Ezekiel 37, 12 to 14, specifically 14, 39, 29. All those passages in Ezekiel show Jehovah God, the Spirit are distinct, but they're one in essence because the Spirit does what only God can do. And again, if you read those passages, let me hammer this point. Ezekiel is another prophet who knew that the Holy Spirit was the one empowering, enabling him to see God visibly because he saw God visibly, the glory of the Lord, which appeared as a man, and to hear God audibly and to be enabled to then carry out God's mission successfully. See, the prophets knew a lot more than what even modern scholars think they knew. And they knew a lot more than these modern day heretics. Amen, right. brother. Also, um, the Biblicist in the chat uh, wrote all those scriptures down, and uh, thank you for that. I'm also going to put them in the description box and as many of the others as, as I can. Uh, we have another question. It's from Emmanuel. Uh, no, you can't. No? He's trying too hard. He's saying, can you show the Trinity, the Spirit of God oh. speaking? Uh, let me read the question first, yeah, yeah. Sam, just for people who are not uh, watching the replay brother sam it just came into my mind in second samuel 23 2 to 3 can we say here is the third person like it says spirit of god speaking father is speaking as god of israel and son is speaking as rock of israel stay away that's a bad argument you're going to make people laugh at the argument saying see you're so desperate you're perverting all scriptures that have a threefold pattern as a reference to the trinity no 
you're trying to prove too much. Calm down because that's not going to work. That's only that's only going to discredit us because they'll say, on what contextual basis can you say the God of Israel is different from the spirit of the Lord and the rock of Israel is someone else? Because the same language is used for all three persons. God the Father is said to be the God of Israel as well as the rock of Israel. Jesus Christ is said to be God and he's the rock. Why can't the same descriptors be applied to the spirit? So the spirit is the God of Israel who's the rock of Israel. Let's not try too hard to read the Trinity everywhere. Good, good advice. Because that will discredit us. Because when we do that, we're going to come out looking like desperate that our case for the Trinity is so weak, we have to then twist such passages that clearly is referring to the same divine person. Because these are three descriptions of the same entity. The Spirit is God who is the rock. Because Jesus is also God and he's rock. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, Romans 9, 5. So is the Father, God, and he's rock. And God the Father is said to be spirit, not the Holy Spirit, but like the Holy Spirit, his nature is spirit. John 4, 24, speaking of God the Father. God is spirit, and those who worship the Father must do so in spirit and truth. So the Father is spirit, not the Holy Spirit. He is God, the God of Israel, and he's the rock, the rock of Israel. Jesus, by virtue of being God, he is spirit. He's also God, and he's also the rock. Same description applied to the Holy Spirit. And where does it say Jesus as God is spirit? 1 Corinthians 15, 45. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, there, Paul says, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, literally living soul. The last Adam, last man, became a life-giving spirit. So as God, his nature is spirit, because the nature of God is spirit, meaning invisible, immaterial, spaceless. As God, he's spirit who gives life, something that only God does. But he's also Adam, man. That's the God man. All right. I'm I'm happy. There's uh, no other questions that I'm aware of. All Let me right. say it that way. <laughs> Thank right. the Lord Jesus for his blessings. May the Lord Amen. fill you guys, your families, your ministry. May it explode in due time for the glory of Christ. May it keep us humble. And pure and righteous and holy and truly loving Jesus by our deeds, not just lip service, and destroy our sins and my pride and arrogance remain teachable. And may the Holy Spirit give us the health we need and the vigor to serve Jesus. And may He also provide for our ministries and for my children in Jesus' name. It was a pleasure to be here. I enjoyed this session. Thank you, Sam. Loved Great you. having you as always. Love you guys. So, Lord, I'll see you soon. All right. And thank you all for in the chat for your um, participation and for, for being uh, kind and uh, friendly and asking good questions. And we uh, do ask that you, um, you know, if you haven't already subscribed, please to subscribe to us. And if you have, please, uh, you know, share something uh, somewhere so that we can get more subscribers. Uh, Amen. We, we do will. appreciate your prayers and your support in every way and just your participation. And of course, we appreciate you know, your love for uh, us. And so thank you so much. That's and God bless you all. By the way, but that's why I upload these sessions to my channel so that I get my subscribers to come to your channel. So hopefully that will work in Lord willing. Right. Well, we appreciate all that right. also. All right. That's all right. it. Thanks for Bye. coming out. God bless Bye. you all. Bye -bye. All right. God bless.